Water is life. Water is tranquility. It fills our oceans, rivers, and lakes. It's also in our games. Throughout the short history of the medium, creators have continued to refine and perfect the display and simulation of H2O. It's a difficult problem to solve, but one that has given birth to a multitude of unique and often beautiful solutions. On this episode of DF Retro, then, we're doing something a little different exploring the evolution of video game water from the 8 and 16-bit days through the birth of 3d graphics and beyond i've selected a number of games for this episode which represent key milestones and techniques in this refreshing corner of game graphics so grab a cool drink sit back and enjoy the plunge into the world of virtual h2o Fire up any recent game, and if it features water in any capacity, chances are good that it'll look suitably refreshing. While proper fluid simulation remains computationally expensive, the visual representation of water has continued to evolve and impress for years. It's fair to say that water looks great in most games released today. But if you dive back into the early days of gaming, water is one of those things that has always been difficult to get right. In early examples, entire stage themes were dedicated to the concept of swimming. Sometimes it worked, other times it was frustrating, but the water itself was typically simplistic in its appearance. Most games from this era rely on a combination of appropriate scenery tiles, a suitable color palette such as blue, and modified controls used to simulate buoyancy. Now, something to keep in mind as we progress through the annals of virtual water is that there are basically three elements which make up the display of water in games. There's the visual element of the water surface, including the animation and reflection of light. There's the wave patterns, which can sometimes be interactive. And there's the rendering of underwater segments in the associated water caustics. Some games focus on just one element, while others attempt to simulate all aspects of the water at least as much as possible. Most retro games then typically focus on just one element. Case in point, the scanline trick in Vice Project Doom, a very late release for the NES. If you check out the background there, reflections, ripples, and indeed the entire parallax background effect are displayed using mid-frame register rights. Things were progressing to the point where things like lights reflecting into a body of water were being considered when drawing the artwork. Batman Return of the Joker for Nintendo Game Boy is another great example. The programmers utilize a pair of tricks to create an impressive water ripple effect. In this case, lines are manipulated in groups of two, allowing the developers to create a warping effect as if the water were passing in front of the scenery. This is combined with flickering, where the water is blanked out every other frame. This likely reduces the cost of the scanline manipulation, but also, thanks to the slow pixel response of the original Game Boy's LCD, it helps give the impression of transparency, since the screen can't update fast enough between frames. It all sort of blends together. Curiously, one of our upcoming examples can be traced back to the Game Boy as well. The original Wave Race is an overhead jet ski racing game. And it's not great. The frame rate is sluggish, and it exhibits screen tearing on real hardware, a lot like Castlevania the Adventure. That said, clever palette manipulation helps give the impression of a translucent water surface, and the name Wave Race would go on to become synonymous with water effects in games. 16-bit consoles then opened greater possibilities when it came to displaying H2O. Underwater, games such as Sonic the Hedgehog and many others for the Sega Genesis make use of their own mid-frame register rights or raster effects to change the color palette at a defined point. This enables bodies of water to display differently than the surface without requiring bespoke tiles. It saves on memory and it looks great. It's even possible to manipulate scan lines to create this underwater ripple effect as we see in Sonic CD. On the Super NES, the addition of color math, which is commonly referred to as transparency, allows developers to utilize bespoke foreground layers specifically for water. 
With the right values, you could create the illusion of a true transparent layer, and it looks great. In fact, the expanded color palette of the Super NES in general allows developers to create things like the water in Secret of Mana. Or Donkey Kong Country for that matter, which is renowned for its underwater stages. But really, it's just smart use of the hardware. The foreground makes use of a scanline effect to create the illusion of ripples, while line scrolling of the background plane allows for increased depth. But what really sells this stage is the choice of color palette. The rich, deep blues of the background just look remarkable, even today. On the water surface side of things, however, developers such as Konami really push the boundaries in terms of neat visual effects. Take Sparkster on the Super NES. A tile and sprite mirroring trick of some sort is used to give the illusion of reflections in this opening stage. With the slight variation in color palette, it genuinely does appear as if it's reflecting the scenery around you. A similar effect is also evident in its prequel, Rocket Knight Adventures on the Sega Genesis, and in the second stage of Castlevania Bloodlines. Konami really seems to have loved this trick. Thunder Force 4, of course, also features a great line scrolling effect and this underwater warping technique when you submerge. I could go on and on, of course, but I think by now you get the point. By and large, water effects during this era were entirely artist driven. Sure, player controls were usually modified to simulate swimming, but the water itself was not a simulated body. But all of this would begin to change as 3D graphics became more common. This is where we would begin to see new innovations in displaying water in video games. During the early days of 3D, processing power was severely limited, and most water surfaces in 3D games were treated as simple planar surfaces with artist-generated textures applied to their surface. The fixed function hardware of this era was fairly limited, true, but it rewarded creativity. Take the original Panzer Dragoon, released in early 1995 in Japan. It's one of the first examples that comes to mind when thinking about water during this era. The first stage roughly simulates the appearance of a large body of water with associated reflections. The Saturn's second video display processor manipulates this plane on a per-line basis to give the illusion of waves, while textures designed to appear warped are manually placed beneath the surface to simulate reflections. By 1996, 3D graphics were taking off on the PC in a big way. Duke Nukem 3D hit the PC in early 96, introducing fully explorable water volumes into the popular first-person shooter genre. While not truly 3D, it was now possible to designate sectors within the game world as water zones while placing an animated water texture on the surface plane. This would be further expanded upon in Shadow Warrior a year later with support for proper transparency. The original Quake delivers a similar effect. In its initial software render, fluid textures are manipulated in code, creating a warbling effect that appears much smoother than the simple water surface in games like Doom or even Duke Nukem 3D. Like Duke, underwater exploration was also possible, but the player view was distorted to simulate the underwater experience. Both of these effects would change when OpenGL support was added in the form of GL Quake. I've always preferred the look of the software render in this regard, however. But there was another more impressive example released months earlier in 1996, Terra Nova Strike Force Centauri from Looking Glass Technologies. Using its advanced software render, Terra Nova is able to present not only massive environments with rolling hills stretching way off into the distance, but it can also simulate the reflectivity of water complete with an associated warping technique. But here's the kicker, Terra Nova seems to use some sort of proto-screen space technique for its reflections. I'm not entirely certain how this works. Perhaps it's just image data stored in an off-screen reflection buffer which is then projected into the space, or maybe it's something else entirely, but either way, it behaves weirdly similarly to modern screen space reflections. When scenery is occluded from view, the reflections disappear as well and there is visible garbage along the edge of the reflection on the left and right side of the screen. For its era, Terra Nova is one of the most advanced simulations of light and reflectivity across a water surface. No wonder this game maxes out at 320 by 400 resolution. 
The original Tomb Raider is another interesting example. While its water surface is a simple transparent texture, Core Design attempted to simulate actual water caustics by warping the vertices designated for underwater zones. The Saturn version even has the edge here, as you can see the geometry distort. It's crude, but it really does give the impression of water caustics. But as impressive as all of these games are, and there are others beyond this, you all know what I'm building towards. No game made waves in this space quite like Nintendo's Wave Race 64. Now, to understand its place in history, keep in mind that the Nintendo 64 itself was first released in 1995 in Japan. This is at a point when consumer 3D graphics cards on the PC were just beginning to appear and had yet to be fully embraced by the industry. Up until this point, 3D graphics in the home were typically handled entirely in software and run on the CPU. Sure, arcade games were more advanced at this point, but they weren't really affordable. Offloading 3D graphics to dedicated hardware is key to the upcoming graphical revolution that would follow, and Nintendo 64 offered many similar features in its own hardware. Games like Super Mario 64 hinted at what could be achieved, but it was Wave Race 64, released in 1996, that demonstrated a new approach to water rendering that would remain impressive for years to come. The idea is simple. The plane on which the player races is represented using a triangular mesh. Using various equations, the developers can dynamically undulate this polygonal mesh, which gives the impression of waves. The jet skis then are designed to collide with this surface, simulating buoyancy in the process. In motion, the effect is remarkably convincing. While it's true that Wave Race 64 runs at a not so blistering 20 frames per second, it was perhaps the first game of its kind to properly simulate the effect of waves in a 3D space while influencing player movement. There's a lot of harsh restrictions in place, sure, but it looks convincing. Case in point, the water mesh itself is constrained around the player character. If we bring in emulated footage in high resolution, this becomes clear as day. The water is only rendered out a few meters or so from the player at any point. If you look beyond this point in space, water is then represented using flat textures. When played in its native resolution on real N64 hardware, however, the two points blend naturally, giving the impression of a large body of water. If we bring up a wireframe representation of the game, we can learn even more. There are different types of waves presented across each course. A base sine wave like Ripple appears at regular intervals here. The point of origin, however, seems anchored to the camera frustum. Notice how the ripples follow the camera and originate from this set position in space. There's other wave patterns as well, such as this one here, which has a fixed position producing larger waves at set intervals. Basically, it seems that Nintendo has defined various rules and points across the surface from which waves are generated. Keep in mind that the jet skis themselves do not actually generate waves. Simple alpha textures are used to simulate water spray instead. Ultimately, Wave Race 64 was a huge leap forward in this regard. Tying gameplay mechanics to wave patterns works extremely well and helps create a very dynamic racing experience. But it's not the only Nintendo 64 game to attempt something like this, however. The puzzle game Wetrix, a falling block game, features an interactive water mesh that rises and falls based on your performance in the game. As you build structures and more water drips onto the playfield, you wind up with these lovely interactive ripples across the game area. Diddy Kong Racing is another example of a fixed wave system. Combining three-dimensional waves on which the player can race with artist-generated animated water textures enables this nice smooth water surface. The game also demonstrates the benefits of bilinear texture filtering in 3D games. Turok Dinosaur Hunter is another great example. While the water itself isn't interactive, like Wetrix, the developers combined several elements to create some of the best-looking water in a first-person shooter from this era. The water plane itself exhibits fixed wave patterns, while a very high-quality animated texture is applied to its surface, and underwater sequences look great as well. A similarly well-animated but even higher-quality implementation showed up in Sega's Virtua Fighter 3, which was released back in 1996. 
Jeffrey's stage here on the beach features gorgeous water textures with water lapping up on the beach during the fight. Speaking of Sega, the Saturn was no slouch during this time either. While the system was no match for N64 in terms of replicating certain visual effects, it did have VDP too. The water trick used in Panzer Dragoon would appear in other games as well, including its two sequels. Panzer Dragoon Saga, the RPG, uses this to create convincing pools of water, even right here at the start of the game, while Panzer Dragoon Zwei offers similar effects in certain stages as well. Then there's Grandia for the Sega Saturn, which renders large bodies of water using VDP2. Again, it's a simple flat plane, but the warping and rippling effect seen here is completely absent from the PlayStation port of the game, and it looks really good here on Saturn, I think. Some other games worth mentioning. Sonic R also takes advantage of VDP2 to create these lovely bodies of water complete with pseudo-reflections. Really though, Sonic R is kind of a technical powerhouse for the system. And while we're talking about Sonic, I think Sonic Jam's free roaming section is also worth mentioning. This is nice looking water, right? Well, yes and no. You see, there's not really any water there at all. It's just a texture trick. There's no surface plane to the water at all. With the selected camera angle and strategic use of splash textures, however, it does give the impression of a true transparent water surface, even when there really is none. Now, the PlayStation doesn't fare quite as well overall, but there are a few examples of great water on the system. Take this pseudo-open-world action game known as Terracon. Not only does the game render a large environment, but it offers a nice three-dimensional solution to waves on a PlayStation 1. And when you fall into the water, the splash textures appear surprisingly detailed, almost as if it's simulating bump mapping. Or how about this miracle port of Hydra Thunder? While the visuals certainly take a hit compared to the original, the results are still supremely impressive for the original PlayStation. But obviously, it's not as refined as the original version of the game. And Hydra Thunder itself is something we need to talk about. It was first released in arcades back in 1998, two years after Wave Race 64. This is a very different sort of game, however. Rather than focusing on wave simulation and wave physics, Hydra Thunder instead focuses on water surface texture and reflections. The portrayal of water looks great, even if it's relatively simple. It's just a large flat plane with nice artwork applied to it. The original arcade game was powered by 3DFX Voodoo Arcade hardware, by the way, but it was quickly ported around to other systems, including Dreamcast, PlayStation, Nintendo 64, and more. The Dreamcast version launched alongside that system and served as a great launch game, but I'm almost more fascinated with the Nintendo 64 and PlayStation versions. The PS1 version that we've already seen looks really impressive, but how about N64? Again, the development team managed to capture the look and feel of Hydra Thunder almost perfectly. It runs at a lower resolution and frame rate, but it's still decidedly Hydra Thunder. It also shows up in a collection released for PlayStation 2, Xbox, and the GameCube known as Midway Arcade Treasures 3. At first glance, it's a nice port, but the alpha textures used to simulate the splashing of your boat across the water surface are hugely toned down across all three versions, making it almost seem as if you're simply clipping through the water plane. Either way, Hydra Thunder was a slick water-based racing game with great visuals, even if it failed to push new boundaries in terms of actual water simulation. 1998 also saw the release of the original Unreal on the PC. This was the first time the Unreal Engine was used in a shipping product, which makes sense since it was specifically crafted for this game. And its fluid system is one of its defining features. Ultimately, it's just a continuation of the flat plane approach seen in Quake, but with much higher quality animated surfaces. It's even possible to use the detail texture layer to add a second pass of water to increase the level of detail. Either way, for such a large-scale shooter, the water looks drop-dead gorgeous, especially for 1998, and it really elevates the experience. Anyone that played Unreal at the time will certainly remember this original waterfall. Or how about Jurassic Park Trespasser for the PC? This long-delayed game is extremely fascinating and something I'd like to examine in a future episode, but today I want to mention its water. The developers managed to craft a simple but effective method for displaying ripples as you move through various water volumes. Now this doesn't apply to the ocean areas surrounding the whole island, that's a simple texture, but small pools of water like this appear fully interactive. Of course, as a game focused on the simulation of physics, it's no surprise to see this attention to detail in place. 
then in 1999, Belgian developer Appeal released Outcast on the PC. It just happens to be one of my favorite PC games of the 90s, but it shipped with insane system requirements due to its software-driven voxel engine. And one of the defining features for the time is its water. Due to the software nature of the engine, the developers were able to pull off some interesting visual tricks, which simulate wave patterns and reflections of light and surroundings within the water surface. It's a simple but effective visual trick. But as the 90s drew to a close, big things were coming and water simulation would grow by leaps and bounds with each passing year. But let's start with fixed function platforms such as Dreamcast and PlayStation 2. There aren't a lot of Dreamcast games which pushed boundaries in this area, mind you. The arcade port of Hydro Thunder looks nice, but what else is there? Well, I believe one of the best examples of 90s style water rendering is found in Echo the Dolphin Defender of the Future. The basic makeup here is simple. The water surface is still just a large flat plane with a nicely animated surface texture applied, but where the game really comes alive is below the ocean surface. The combination of depth fog, water caustics, and great texture work really helps bring the world of Echo to life. I did, however, notice that the presentation of water caustics only applies to specific objects and models. In this scene, for instance, Echo receives the effect while the two dolphins beside him do not. Still, the underwater world of Echo is remarkably evocative even today and well worth revisiting. Surf Rocket Racers from CRI is another decent example as well with predefined wave patterns across its surface mesh and a decent animated texture applied to that surface. Nothing amazing perhaps, but it still looks nice and it's neat to see the jet skis interacting with the water surface. Super Magnetic Neo is another fun example. While limited to just a few areas in the game, this title features pools of water with an interactive mesh which reacts to Neo's movements. Again, a small but nice touch. Swinging back around to the PlayStation 2, however, this is the platform where we started seeing major changes in terms of how water is rendered in games. Following the launch of the system, new titles started to appear showcasing impressive new methods for rendering water. Games such as Eco with its memorable windmill sequence, which ripples and changes when you jump in, or these little waterfalls in the original Dark Cloud stand out. So how do you pull something like this off? Well, I spoke to a developer that spent years working on the PlayStation 2 and they shared a couple different methods for generating water on the system. First, let's recall that the PlayStation 2 features two key components, the Emotion Engine and the Graphics Synthesizer. The Emotion Engine features a pair of vector processing units, VU0 and VU1, which are basically DSPs designed for fast 3D math, almost like a precursor to a vertex shader pipeline. Knowing this, developers could use the vector units to aid with water calculations. This technique is likely what you're seeing in games like Eco when you jump into the reflective pool of water. Basically, you could process water mesh ripple deformations and the like using one of the vector units, compute any reflection lookups, such as the surroundings near the windmill, and then send it all to the graphics synthesizer in one pass. Since everything is handled directly between the GS and vector units, the CPU bus is not bogged down by these operations. The PS2 can perform the necessary calculations very quickly because of this design. Water displacement then is handled by sending water contact with various bodies along with the vertex data to the vector unit where you can then generate waves based on that information. Another more advanced solution can be observed in the game Splashdown from Rainbow Studios. Using the technology built for ATV off-road fury, Rainbow tackled the water sports genre to great effect. Basically, the developers send the water surface rectangle itself to the vector units, which then process all necessary tessellation on the surface. With Splashdown, the water surface basically uses view-dependent adaptive tessellation, whereby the water mesh itself appears more complex when in close proximity to the camera. Over time, interactive water meshes would become increasingly common on the system. Even games like Neo Contra featured areas with simple interactive water meshes, but perhaps one of the best examples of this can be seen in Bowder's Gate Dark Alliance. Ask anyone about impressive water throughout the history of games, and this is likely one of the first titles that people will bring up, and for good reason. 
Dark Alliance itself is a bit of a technical masterpiece here, featuring a smooth 60 frames per second frame rate, hugely complex geometry setup, and the best image quality on PlayStation 2. The lead programmer on the project was none other than Ezra Driesbach, who longtime DF Retro viewers might remember from Lobotomy Software, where he worked on Power Slave, Quake, and Duke Nukem 3D for Sega Saturn. And thanks to the reliance on vector units and its fast triangle setup, the PS2 was well suited to adaptive geometry subdivision necessary to pull off smooth, rippling water surfaces. Other consoles from this era were slower in performing these calculations as they'd have to rely on the base CPU, though in reality, another important hardware feature, which we'll discuss shortly, would allow these consoles to push beyond the PS2. What makes Dark Alliance stand out here, then, is the quality of the water ripples used in the game. Every object can interact with every surface of water, with all actors producing appropriate ripples while moving through it. This can lead to some dramatic effects during a hectic battle, and the game simply never slows down. Even today, the fluidity of the water in Dark Alliance stands the test of time brilliantly. The game was also ported to Xbox and GameCube, where it looks similarly nice, but image quality and water quality isn't quite on par with the PS2 version. One other very different example of water on the PS2 that I'm fond of can be found in Time Crisis 2. When engaged in a battle during this river chase sequence, the water features an impressively detailed reflection, which warbles realistically as you move across its surface. It's another simple flat plane, of course, but the effect is convincing nonetheless. Another example that I'm fond of is the water in Klonoa 2. This is one of my favorite platform games on the system, and while the effect is fairly simplistic, I really like the look of their animated water texture combined with things like the waves in this very first stage. Seeing all of this play out at 60 frames per second back in 2001 was quite something to behold. This is also the console generation when water effects such as rain really started to take off. Metal Gear Solid 2 really led the charge on this with a natural looking effect that still holds up really well today. Konami utilized the extra fill rate of the PlayStation 2 to really push this effect up to 11, while also simulating things such as water reflections in the deck of the ship by simply drawing objects below the surface and using an appropriate texture on the top. At this point in time, the portrayal of water in games was improving by leaps and bounds. More and more developers were finding ways to simulate things like waves and interaction with water, while artists were taking advantage of new techniques to create beautiful new experiences. But things evolved quickly during this generation, when two new consoles arrived on the market more than one year after PlayStation 2. The arrival of GameCube, the Xbox, and more advanced PC accelerator hardware signaled new techniques, including the advent of programmable shaders, allowing artists to push new boundaries in terms of water rendering but we'll have to wait until next week to explore these systems. That's right, in part two of the evolution of video game water, we'll explore classics such as Super Mario Sunshine with its beautiful ocean and sunny beaches, Wave Race Blue Storm, which pushes interactive water to the next level, Xbox games such as Morrowind, Halo, Bloodwake, and beyond with their pixel-shaded water effects, Half-Life 2 on the PC, and so much more. So be sure to check back for that. For this episode, however, I think we've covered a lot of ground. During the early days of 8 and 16-bit titles, water was utilized more as a mechanic than as a visual nicety, which gave birth to the idea of water-themed levels, which persist to this day. Once 3D graphics entered the picture, however, attempts to simulate the fluidity of H2O started to appear, and while it doesn't look especially realistic now, neither did the surrounding graphics, so it worked. At the turn of the century, however, more realistic visuals meant that an increased focus on water was necessary if it were to match up to its more realistic surroundings. The extra processing power of new machines during this era greatly increased the quality of water rendering. But we're going to have to leave it there. That's the end of part one. But with so many games to choose from, I couldn't possibly include everything in this episode, so be sure to share your favorite examples in the comments below or over on Twitter. If you enjoyed this video, however, be sure to like, subscribe, and click the bell icon to help keep us going. And until next episode, stay retro.